We might as well get going. Welcome, welcome. I'm here to start in on chapter 10, which is the uh, vibrations and oscillations chapter. Hope everybody's comfortable. There's plenty of seats if you want to, are just coming in, I think. Um, so there's a new homework, uh, which is due on Friday of this week. Uh, also, I have posted an optional item called Chapter 10 Videos Optional. Uh, there are all these sort of Khan Academy style videos. Uh, the way it goes is there's sort of two, um, I guess, main situations that come up a lot in this particular chapter. One is mass on a spring. So there's a video that goes through conceptually what's happening when you have a mass M that's attached to a spring with the spring constant K and that can oscillate. And then it goes through a more quantitative example with uh, where it solves a problem. And the other one is pendulum. So a simple pendulum, uh, if you displace it from the bottom and let it go, it swings back and forth also with the same sort of oscillatory simple harmonic motion. We'll talk about both of those today. But again, the first video is sort of conceptual, leads you through the ideas. And then the second video is, um, is a problem solving quantitative one. So there you go. I really recommend that you, that you check these out. Okay, so the basic idea with this chapter, I think I can do it. Oh, I got it. <laughs> just turn this on. Who's off? Oh, wait. I think someone looked at um, I need to. Is it okay? Yeah. Um, can I borrow that? So we've been studying, uh, we started off by studying linear motion. We've also done uh, objects moving constant speed in a circle. This is a bit different. In this chapter, we study a new kind of motion. Uh, it's going to be called uh, simple harmonic motion, uh, in which both the, the, I guess, the direction and the speed change. So. Okay. <laughs> sure is a good thing I have Pius doing all this stuff, because I could never figure out all these little switches and buttons man, every day. So hello to the video overflow section. Okay. I think we might as well just get going. And the way I wanted to start is actually we we're talking about things that vibrate back and forth and it's all around you. So there's these springs. If I pull on a spring, it goes boing. Uh, if I put a stick like this, a bamboo stick straight up and down and I sort of hit it, or if I, or if I hold it right, that, it oscillates back and forth. Oscillations are all around us and they have, uh, they have certain properties. Even, even this building, if you, uh, if you do any observations in telescopes at the top of this building, which I've, I've done, you realize that the whole building is swinging back and forth. And when you have uh, any kind of oscillating motion, you have a period. In the case of this building, the period is about 1.2 seconds. And so if you're tracking on a star, you're going back and forth every 1.2 seconds, especially if it's really windy. So the idea is that we've plotted position here on the vertical axis and then time on the horizontal axis. We're back to these position versus time graphs. And in all these cases, something is changing and then it gets back to its original position once every period where we're using the capital letter T uh, for period in seconds. What's this? Oh, it's a video. Okay, so this, <laughs> I didn't bring this demo, but it's a little YouTube video which is showing you and there's some sort of birds chirping in the background. Uh, what's going on here is that you have an object which is in equilibrium. There's water at the bottom of this tube, and that's keeping it sort of, I guess the gravitational torque is to the right of the pivot. And then it's filling up, filling up, filling up, and the water level is going up and up and up until the center of mass of this thing goes to the left of the pivot, and then it dumps out, and again, the center of mass is back on the other side of the pivot and goes up again. So the reason I'm showing you this, there's a little bit in there about torque from pre previous chapters, but um, it's, it's an oscillating motion that has a period, but it's not simple harmonic motion. You're not going to describe this by a sine wave. It's more of a sort of a sawtooth, it's, or a, I guess a square wave. It stays constant for a long time, a little bit decreasing, and then goes down quickly and then back up again. And so it has some sort of weird shape that's not a, not a cosine wave. Well, I could just watch that all day and listen to the birds chirp. <laughs> well, let's move on. <laughs> okay. 
So we've got period, the other thing is frequency. The frequency is the number of cycles per second, and frequency and period are related by uh, this equation. Frequency is one over the period. And you can also solve it out for period. If you have the frequency, the period is one over the frequency. <laughs> Oscillate, so if the period's in seconds, the frequency is in like, seconds to the minus one or inverse seconds. And I guess cycles per second, there's a lot of words to describe this unit. And one of the words that comes up a lot in the book is hertz. So one hertz uh, is one cycle per second, named after some physicist named Hertz, I guess. It's also a rental car company. But... Okay. So let's see if we can do a question here. So that should be in your device. So that same Japanese fountain that we saw that was going plunka, plunka with some oscillation period, if we, um, or say it has some oscillation frequency, if we turn up the water, it'll go up and down with a faster frequency. We might double the frequency. In that case, what happens to the period? Actually, think about that for a minute. So free to discuss with your neighbor. Make sure you vote in the same way as your neighbor. Okay. So uh, my answer that I liked was B, just that the, the period is reduced to one half. So if T1, I guess, is one over the F1, and the F2 is two times the first frequency, then T2 is just gonna be one over two times F1, which is one over two times T1. Make sense? Half. Let's do another quick one. A pendulum, and, and this is actually a little uh, animation that I found in Wikipedia. For some reason, it's called a seconds pendulum, but the pendulum has a period of two seconds, and you can time it. One, one thousand, two. <laughs> Somehow it goes back and forth once every two seconds. Um, what's the frequency of that pendulum? Give you a minute again to, th to uh, think about it and then pair up with your neighbor and discuss it. The survey says. Yeah, so this was pretty good. Half a hertz. So that's what half a hertz looks like. Again, you just do one over two seconds, the 0 0.5. You can call it 0 0.5 seconds to the minus one, or you can call it 0 0.5 hertz. So that was really good. Most people got it. Okay. So now we're getting into the real meat of this chapter, which is called simple harmonic motion. So this is a particular type of oscillating motion. And there's, like I say, two main examples of it. One is going to be mass on the spring, and the other one is going to be uh, the pendulum. So let's start with mass on the spring. So you have a spring, one end of it is attached to a fixed wall, the other end of it is attached to a mass, and the mass is sitting on a frictionless surface. Uh, you release it, and it returns to equilibrium, will the mass be moving? And the answer is yes. If the equilibrium sort of is the middle, like it's six, whatever this is, this is not T, this is meters or something, if the equilibrium is here, if you release it out at eight and it comes back to six, um, at that mo moment, it won't be accelerating because the force from the spring goes to zero at equilibrium, but it will still be moving. So one of the uh, ideas with a simple harmonic motion is that when something is pulled back to its equilibrium by some restoring force, it usually overshoots that equilibrium ends up on the other side, and then the res restoring force reverses. So some of the vocabulary we're using here, one of them is uh, equilibrium position, so all simple harmonic motion is going to be oscillating around some center point, which is called the equilibrium position. If it's a mass on a horizontal spring, that's just the place where the, the spring is at its natural equilibrium. It is neither stretched nor compressed. The other vocab uh, word here is restoring force. So 
a restoring force is one that is zero if you're at equilibrium, but when you go away from equilibrium, there's a growing force that tries to accelerate this object back towards its equilibrium state. And in the case of the spring, we have Hooke's law. If you stretch a spring, it's, it's pulling that mass back towards equilibrium. If you have a mass and you compress the spring, it's pushing that mass back towards its equilibrium. It's trying to restore it to equilibrium. Okay, so this is where we get into the math of it. And the math looks easy, but then suddenly gets really hard. And so it starts off with just Hooke's law. Very easy. F equals negative K times X. Sounds easy. Then there's Newton's second law. F equals MA. Again, sounds easy. So I guess we can combine these two equations and solve for acceleration. A equals negative K over M times X. And when you're, when you're at this point of solving this problem, you think, well, I guess I'm done. Like, this is great. But then, if you think about this equation, you're solving for acceleration in terms of these variables. But what is acceleration? Well, acceleration, we define it as being the rate of change of velocity. So it's the slope of the velocity versus time graph. And velocity was the slope of the x versus time graph. So this, this equation, there's x. So what this equation is telling us is that the slope of the slope of, of this thing on the right is equal to negative k over m times that thing that you had the slope of. So it's, this is called differential equation, and it's a very weird thing. It's uh, certainly not constant acceleration. What's interesting is that if x is positive, then there's this negative acceleration. If x is negative, then there's this positive acceleration. If x is zero, then there's zero acceleration. So as this object moves, uh, the acceleration is changing all the time. As soon as it moves a little bit, there's a new acceleration. So anything we used about equations of kinematics before will not work for simple harmonic motion. Or will they? Let's, let's think. Maybe I can do a, a kind of a kludge. I don't, has anyone heard the word kludge before? So, a kludge is sort of a fix where it's sort of a messy fix that might kind of work. And the, the two classic kludges are uh, duct tape and WD-40. If something moves and it shouldn't move, duct tape. If something should move but it doesn't move, WD-40. And you know, these are the two. Anyway, so we're going to do a kludge, and it's called numerical integration. So it's going to sound a little approximate, but just bear with me. The whole idea here is that we have acceleration, not constant. Velocity, not constant. But if you choose a very small interval of time, delta t, then maybe it's sort of approximately constant. Like if something, like it, maybe if it's over a hundredth of a second, and you've got something that's moving like this, and over that hundredth of a second, it only moves maybe like a, some percentage. So if the acceleration is almost constant over a small time, delta t, we could use our equation for constant acceleration, which is that v final, is the initial plus a times delta t, roughly, as long as delta t is small. And then we're also going to do, what if the velocity was kind of constant? Then we can just use that x, the position, is the old position x initial plus v times delta t. Again, very kludgy. But now that you have a new value of x, you could just compute the new value of uh, acceleration using that Hooke's law thing again and then do the next segment, and the next segment, and the next segment. So I'm going to try doing this with an Excel spreadsheet, and we'll just see how it goes. So let's escape out of the PowerPoint and just try it. And I actually even posted this Excel spreadsheet on the website for you. There it is. Okay. So this is Excel, and what I've done is all the numbers that are in pink, these little sort of pink squares are input numbers where I've just typed a number. I type 0.01 here, I type 1 here, I type 1 there. And what these are are some constants. So I'm going to do a time step of 0.01 seconds, hundredth of a second. That's pretty small. Maybe it's good enough. And I'm going to put a mass on a spring. So I'm going to make the spring constant, let's just make it 1 Newton per meter. 
And then I'm going to set the mass, let's just say it would be one kilogram. Okay. So then I have some more pink numbers. The initial time in this, the initial time is zero seconds. And I'm going to put initial position one meter away from equilibrium. And then the initial velocity will just start at a rest. Okay. So now all the numbers that are in white are things that I'm calculating using some equation. So this is the equation, and it uses all these other cells. So what is it? It's negative 1. So it's the acceleration using this Hooke's law. Negative k times x over m. So it's negative 1 times e1, which is the k, times c4, which is the x, uh, divided by g1, which is the mass. Um, and the dollar signs, the reason I've got the dollar signs in there is because if you do control C and then go to another cell and do control V to copy it, the thing, the cells that are in dollar signs stay exactly the same. But the things that are not in dollar signs, then Excel tries to kind of intelligently update it. So example, if I press control C and then go right below it, control V, do you see how it's E1 and G1 are the same exactly, but it's gone to C5. It's now using this new value of X. The time, this is simple, it's just doing uh, the, the time above plus this time step, uh, delta C, so if I do control C and go below it, control V, it just goes to the next time, 0 0.02 seconds. X, I'm using this kludge equation, which is X final equals X initial plus um, V, I guess the old V, times DT. It's just updating x using the equation of assuming constant velocity. So I can do that, uh, control C, and then control V. Whoop. Still one, that's kind of weird. I feel like x should be decreasing a little bit. I mean, there's enough, enough decimal places. Let's see what it looks like here. Yeah, so it's actually 0 0.999. So it's a little less, and you can see it on the graph going down. And then the, whoops, we'll do that. The velocity is using that constant acceleration equation. So d4 is, um, it's the old velocity plus e4, which is the old acceleration, times c1, where c1 is this time step. Again, so it's just v final is v initial plus a times dt. So, and again, what I can do is just control c, and then press control v, and then I can do the same with acceleration, control c, and control v. And I can do that again and again. Let's select all these things. Control C, all of them. And Control V. Oop. Let's go down here. So you see what's happening? Is every time I do this, it's going up, time steps are going up, and the mass is getting pulled back towards the equilibrium. Okay. So you got it. So let's just do a whole bunch of these. Let's do a um, let's do like 600 time steps. And I'll press shift, click, and then control V. And look at that. Okay, so what does that look like? It looks like a smile, doesn't it? It looks like <laughs> cosine. Okay, so this is like... I don't know, this is like epic kludge or something. Something happened here which I didn't expect. All I did was use x equals x initial plus v times d, v equals v initial times a times dt, and I also had somewhere up there I had the um, uh, Hooke's law, and I ended up with cosine. And, I, and I, when I first did this, long, long ago, I almost fell off my chair like, where does this come from? Not only is it cosine, if you look at it very carefully, um, like, here, let's look at this point way out here. It comes back to its original point at 6.28 seconds. Do you know what 6.28 is? It's 2 pi. It's like so exactly cosine that it's spooky, okay? Like, it's, it's cosine if you use radians, which is the natural unit of, of uh, angle. So, <laughs> I mean, cosine, remember Sokotoa, it's the CAH. Co cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. What the hell does that have to do with the mass in the spring? Nothing, absolutely nothing. <laughs> and yet, here we are, we've got cosine is somehow the answer for the position of a mass in a spring. And you can do uh, fun things, what can you do? Like you could do, uh, let's, let's, change, let's change the mass, let's make it 
two kilograms. So that's slowed it down. It's increased the period. Actually, let's make it uh, four kilograms. So then, then it goes, I guess, to about halfway through. So I think what I've done is I've doubled the period by increasing the mass. What if I go back to, let's make it one kilogram, but I increase the spring constant. Let's make it two. That, in, that decreases the period. I could make spring constant four, then that doubles the period. You can also see what's happening here is that the, this goes back to beyond one. I think this is because I've chosen this time step to be too big. It's a mistake in the numerical integration. It should never go back up above one. Um, so I should probably decrease the time step, but then it won't go quite as far. So let's put it back at one for now. Uh, the other thing we could do, I guess, is we could start it at x equals zero. Well, then it doesn't do anything. It just sits at equilibrium. Oh, but we could give it a kick. Let me give it uh, v equals plus one. And there's sine, okay. Again, just mind boggling. It's like, where is this coming from? What does this have to do with the triangle? And once again, I don't really have an answer for you. I don't actually know what's going on. But you can play around with it. I posted it on the website. Um, numerical integration works. I'm here to tell you that I went to calculus class and they did this exact problem, which is that you've got uh, the double time derivative of something equals a negative constant times that same thing. And what happens in calculus class is they write that down. It's a differential equation. And then the, the professor turns around and he says, now we shall introduce a trial solution. And the trial solution is that. And then goes back and just keeps going and proves that it's correct and all this stuff. And so if you raise your hand, and this is some speaking from personal experience and say, professor, professor, but where did you get the, uh, the A cosine 2 pi over T times T? He said, it's a trial solution, and it works. And then that's it. That's the best explanation anyone's ever going to give you, I think. So this is our strategy. We are just going to believe that it works. It does work. It's highly motivated by that Excel spreadsheet kludge, which shows you that's what it's supposed to be. Um, and there you go. That's simple harmonic motion. We're just going to play with this equation from now on. We're going to just believe it. Oh, yeah, so sine works. Just a different initial condition. Turns out sine and cosine are the same thing. Just shift it over a little bit, if you think about it as a function. So do you get what we're doing? What we're doing is instead of taking sine as being, or, or cosine as being like the ratio of the adjacent over the hypotenuse or the, um, whatever, the opposite over hypotenuse, we are now treating sine and cosine as a function. So if I have a calculator and I type, you know, whatever, 50, and I press the cos button, then it, well, syntax error, I have to press cos, sorry, <laughs> I have to press cos, 50, execute, it gives me back a number. So I put an input number, it gives me an output number. And that's, that's how we're using this, it's a function now. And it works really well for simple harmonic motion. So that's a new vocab word, simple harmonic motion, uh, is motion that can be described by this x equals a, a is a constant, times cosine of 2 pi over t, t is another constant, times lowercase t, where lowercase t is the independent uh, variable. It's a mathematical model of motion. It's motivated by this idea. If you've got a spring force, is negative kx, Hooke's law, uh, and the acceleration is, and that's the net force, is uh, the spring force over m, then you get as position, like if position is positive, then you've got a negative acceleration. If position is negative, then you've got a positive acceleration, et cetera, et cetera. And it's fun to try to draw it, so let's do that. Press the switch button. Uh, let's try it in blue. So let's say we've got, um, let's make a plot of position versus time. So if this is time and this is x, well, I'm going to try to draw it. I start here. When I go through 0, I'm still moving. And then I get to some minimum. And I go through 0, I'm still moving. And I turn around there. It takes a little bit of practice, but it's fun to draw these. And then it goes on and on and on. And this is called plus a is the maximum value of x. And this is called minus a is the minimum value of x. So one thing to notice 
is that the full range of motion of this mass back and forth is actually uh, uh, 2 times A. So sometimes A, it's usually called the amplitude, but you, sometimes I hear it called the half amplitude because it's half the, the complete range of motion. Okay, so what's interesting here is that right here and here you have uh, zero slope. Actually, also, way down here. So all those points where there's zero slope, I better have zero for my velocity curve. Okay, so even right here, actually, better the, the value, I'm going to now make a plot here in green of V versus T. This is velocity versus time. I'm going to make that value of velocity go through zero there. And then this has a maximum negative slope. So I guess negative slope right when it passes through that first thing. So I'm going to have to go down here and put on my minimum value of V right there. So it's going to look like this. And then your maximum positive slope is right there, max slope. So that's going to be my maximum value. And it's going to kind of look like this. Okay, where this is V max, and this is negative V max. And it actually doesn't look like sine, it looks like negative sine as it turns out. And then same sort of thing is that the slope of the slope is acceleration versus time. So this, again, zero slope right there. Zero slope there, zero slope there, zero slope. So those are the points where I'm going to have to have the acceleration go through zero. Sort of just go down at those particular instants of time. And then this is the maximum slope, max slope of V versus T. So that's going to be your maximum value of acceleration and your minimum slope right there. That's going to be your minimum. So then I guess I kind of go like this. And like I say, it's, it's a bit instructive to try to draw these. And this is A versus time. Okay. And then you can kind of see that when X is maximum, A is minimum, et cetera, et cetera. And when A is minimum, sorry, when X is minimum, the A is, is maximum. So that's your simple harmonic motion. I want to go to a uh, learning catalytic question. This is the position uh, graph, position versus time graph of uh, a mass on a spring. And the way it goes here is that um, it says little x hat is to the right. So what's that saying is that positive values of x is to the right. And we plot that as, as positive, positive on this vertical axis. And then negative, anything that's negative is uh, meaning towards the left. Does that make sense? So what you're asked about is this particular instant of time, which is indicated by the dashed line. For that particular instant, what can you say about the velocity uh, and the force at that point? You should think about that and check with your neighbor, and I'll give you a minute. We'll stop. We'll do another one of these in a second. Yeah, so what I got here is that in terms of velocity, this is x versus time, so zero slope means that it's got zero velocity here. So v equals zero. So it's got to be uh, d or e. And then the force, so what I think here is that the x is to the left of equilibrium, so this is compressed spring, compressed down here, and that means that the force is pushing it towards the right. Okay, so I like d. Now let's do that exact same question again, but for a different instant of time. Again, I'll give you a minute to uh, think, pair, and share up. Yeah, so you guys have got this pretty much. So again, slope here is positive, so it's got to be velocity positive. Also, the force is zero because at this instant of time, the spring is actually at equilibrium, passing through equilibrium, so it's, it's at its unstretched I guess, um, position, so the force is zero. Okay. The period of this motion, we sort of figured this out when we were doing, do you remember when I had the Excel spreadsheet up and I changed the mass? 
Uh, if I change the mass, then it went slower and the period increased. Uh, if, if I increase the mass, if I increase the spring constant, then the period seemed to decrease. So this is the actual equation for it. Also, I think I saw that if I, if I times these things by, t by 4, that's when it, it changed the, the period by a factor of 2. So that's where the square root comes in. And there's a 2 pi out front for some reason. Um, and so, so this is the equation, by the way, that x is equal to a times cosine of 2 pi over capital T times t. So the two constants are a and t. A is set by the initial conditions. Whatever your initial position and velocity are, that will give you your amplitude. <laughs> Let's just do another question, shall we? You guys seem in a energetic mood. So let's do a couple more of these. Which of the two constants in this equation, so remember x and t are the variables, and a and capital T, sorry, x and lowercase t are the variables, capital A and capital T are the constants. So which of these two constants uh, is determined by the initial position and the velocity of the mass? Is it just a or is it uh, just t or is it both a and t or are neither of them determined by Give you a minute. Get A or C here. Let's uh, got an answer. Let's see what the survey says. Um, stop. Hmm. Okay. So the uh, the the moral of the story here is that just due to the way simple harmonic motion works, the period is always two pi times the square root of uh, m divided by k, always, okay? So it's uh, set by the physical properties of the system. It's a little bit hard to, uh, to prove that to you. One of the things I don't have is a frictionless surface to do a horizontal mass. But I guess one thing that I can do is have a vertical mass, and we'll talk vertical spring. If I have small oscillations, is what it's saying, like that, they go up and down with some particular period. And if I have larger oscillations, it goes faster, but the actual, I need to, actually you know what we should do? Let's have two identical springs, and then we'll show it. But I'll, I think I'll do another learning catalytics first, and then I'll try to convince you. Um, but the amplitude is definitely set by initial conditions, so it's only the amplitude. Let's do another one. This one you should be able to hopefully get. you got a mass. It's oscillating in simple harmonic motion, and it's got some amplitude. And it's got some period. When it passes through its equilibrium, and it's coming at you, you give it a kick, which suddenly slows it down. I guess you've sort of decreased some of its kinetic energy just as it's passing through its equilibrium point. What does that do to the period? Going once, I'm going twice, and then we'll discuss. Uh, okay, so what I'm saying, and again, it's <laughs> once again, the period is set by the properties of the system. Now, another most popular answer is that the, uh, the period would go up if you slow it down. So, and it does kind of make sense. If you slow something down, it should take longer to go there, right? But it, the amplitude also goes down. So remember that range of motion is the amplitude or twice the amplitude. If you decrease the speed, it decreases the range. So it does go slower, but it has less far to go, and somehow those two effects cancel each other out. I don't know if you can see these two masses hanging side by side, but I'm going to put them both into simple harmonic motion. One I'm going to pull down a little bit, and one I'm going to pull down a lot. I'm going to release them from rest at the same moment. Do you see how they're oscillating at the same period? Pretty much. This one's going a lot faster because I gave it more initial energy, but it's going a lot further. And so it does its periods um, at, uh, in this, at, this, at the same period, right? Or same frequency or something. 
Okay, do you believe me? So this is one of the magics of simple harmonic motion, is that the period is only determined by the properties of the system. Now, I've pulled the wool over your eyes a little bit with this hanging spring, because we've only done the horizontal spring. So, th so there it is. So this is just period is 2 pi m over k. A is set by the initial conditions. The vertical mass on the spring uh, is, turns out, is just like the uh, horizontal mass on the spring, but it has a different equilibrium. So if you have um, a spring and it's unstretched, so let's stop looking at these for a second. Stop you. Let's put these down. These are distracting. And let's look for a minute at this one. If you have a hanging spring, the big complication is that there are now two equilibriums. There's the equilibrium of the spring, which is here's the spring where if you compress it, it pushes. If you pull it, it, uh, it sorry. <laughs> if you stretch it, it pulls. If you compress it, it pushes. And right there is the spring equilibrium. That's one equilibrium. And then, and then but if you put a mass on it, the mass comes to rest and does not accelerate if it's right here. So this is an, a different equilibrium. See what I'm saying? There's like the mass on the spring equilibrium and there's the spring only equilibrium. So way that, the way that works is um, you have, I guess, this is what I call the spring equilibrium. And then what you have down here is the new equilibrium for the mass, which is when um, F spring upwards is going to be equal to the force of gravity downward on that mass. And this stretching distance, I guess X is equal to uh, delta L. So if you've got uh, K times delta L, that equals m times g, and you get the delta L is equal to mg over k. So that's the distance now between the spring equilibrium and the new equilibrium. And what you just do is you set uh, vertical mass in a spring is also simple harmonic motion, but you set y equals 0 to be the mass equilibrium position, the new mass equilibrium position. So it's wherever the mass would be not accelerating if you stopped it moving. That's now the equilibrium. And if I disturb it, so it's this equilibrium now, if I pull it down and let it go, it oscillates up and down above that new equilibrium. So the equation looks like this. Um, y is equal to A times cosine of 2 pi over capital T times lowercase t, where again, uh, t is 2 pi times square root of m over k. So the, the gravity just doesn't matter. It just sets a new, new equilibrium position. And a is the amplitude. Okay. So that's why I'm able to get away with that. And I think next thing we're going to talk about is going to be the pendulum. Which also turns out, but I think we'll do that in the next hour. So, Any questions?